Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. We are about to go into our midday worship, amen. Well, our morning worship. I'm going to invite everybody just to stand. I know we've been standing for a while, but I'm just inviting us to stand again. Amen. And I just want us to reflect a little bit on God's goodness. Just a little bit of his, on his just great ways. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let's get our minds focused. Let's all just get our minds focused on Jesus. Amen. Come on. Let's all stand. If you are able to stand, let's all just stand. And let's just close our eyes and just worship. Just Remember the purpose for coming here. Amen. The, the purpose for coming here is really to glorify Jesus. Nothing else matters. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, Jesus, you're worthy, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Isaiah chapter 6, it reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the, first, the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered it, his face, and... With twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Can we just cry holy? Come on, people of God. Let's just cry holy. Holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with your power and glory. Jesus, hallelujah. 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 Come on. We're not going to sing a song until we start to worship. Come on. Let's just focus. Let's make the best opportunity because we may never get the opportunity to come back into his house and really worship him again. We never know what can happen. We are well today and like the grass, we wither tomorrow. Come on. Come on. Life is unpredictable. Come on. Let's worship jesus hallelujah hallelujah god almighty i don't know if this is my last day but what i am going to do is to give you the best you are holy god almighty i bow on my knees and cry holy 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 is the lord of hosts hallelujah 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 jesus 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 hallelujah come on there was a time when only a certain set of people could uh enter into the tabernacle and go to god's holy place and and feel his shekinah glory and his presence and hallelujah that system was just for the privileged but ah he went on calvary's cross and he died and after that happened he tore the veil that separated us and so everybody including the scum named Kavian Kennedy could come into his presence and offer what I deem to be worship. Come on, let's worship him. Jesus, you're awesome, God Almighty. Lord Jesus, you are great and mighty, God Almighty. You are all sufficient, God Almighty. 
we are insufficient God Almighty hallelujah hallelujah there is no spot no stain no blemish no flaw in your character Jesus you are absolutely perfect oh God hallelujah 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 Jesus you are always right oh God and we are always wrong hallelujah 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 your way is the only safe way hallelujah your way is the only true way hallelujah hallelujah Jesus in comparison to everybody else God Almighty you stand afar off oh God you are great and mighty oh God hallelujah oh, oh, holy is the Lord God Almighty hallelujah 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 I wonder if we could see the Lord for really who he is. Hallelujah. 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 Heaven is your throne room, Jesus. The earth is your footstool, oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, come on, just 30 seconds more. Hallelujah to Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Singers, please forgive me, but please forgive me. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let's sing. Holy. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. 
Hallelujah. 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 I see the Lord. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. Exalted high. Exalted high above. Of the people of the earth. Of the people of the earth. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. I see the Lord. Oh! 
could take this song literal. Forever, forever you would be. I wonder if we could just bow before the Lord today. Whether we bow our knees or we bow our hearts. Hallelujah, Jesus. And I let the end my knees to worship you, Lord. To worship you, Lord. Come on, one more time. Forever you be. Forever.
worship him alone now. Like to like to suggest to us that if 
we have anything else on our agenda and the worship of Jesus Christ and if we are not prepared to surrender that agenda to worship him it would be more profitable for us to go home now because whatever we do in here won't be accepted so we have two choices either to get with God's agenda or at least not to stay here and forward our own agenda we're here to worship Jesus nothing else matters right now one more time would you slip your hands up just magnify it. I'm serious about that brethren it would be more profitable for us to go home To worship him alone when we sing to worship you alone of course that doesn't mean that we're not worshiping a cow or an image because we could say we believe in one God and not worship him it's not really a particular benefit, brethren, just to believe in one God. The Bible says the devil believes in one God. So if you believe in one God, so does the devil. It's what we do with the one God that we say we believe in. So if if you have set yourself up as God in your heart, you're not worshiping Jesus alone. If there is some idol in your life that you have set up, you're not worshiping him alone. Is there any possibility of us today ensuring that we worship him alone? My, my, my. Gladly bend my knees to worship you alone. We're going to pray. We need to pray. We're going to pray. I'd like for us to kneel on our knees if it's possible. 
and just spend a little time talking to Jesus. We haven't done this in a little while. Let's humble our hearts and humble ourselves and just bow and talk to Jesus from our hearts. Yes.
Let's stand now and lift our hands. Magnify the name of the Lord. Who alone is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. Eulogized forever. God blessed forever. His name is Jesus. He's the one. He's the one. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one. Uh, I'm going to just take the time to ask some persons persons whose hearts the Lord has touched this morning if you would help me with these prayer requests I want you to uh, I want us to take our ministry of praying for people who have sent in requests a little further. So, I'd like for you to, if the Lord so moves on your heart, to come and take one of these prayer request forms. We're not going to pray in the service. I want to ask you to take the card home with you and to spend some time today and during the course of the week praying for the need. I want to ask you if it's possible, if there's a phone number to call and let the person know that you have been praying for them. Don't pry into their lives. Don't ask them for money. Just tell them that I've been so burdened by your need. And I'm just, I've just been praying for you. And I want you to know there are persons who are praying for you. Would you just distribute them for me? Those that are not distributed, you can give them back to me. I, I took a prayer request card one Sunday and when I had an opportunity I went upstairs and called the person or called the relative of the person. The person was in the intensive care unit and um, but they were just so blown away by the fact that somebody would do that who didn't even know their relative and I was leaving and I told them I would follow up and I, I gave the car to a precious lady and asked her to follow up and she has been following up and making contact and building a relationship. You just never know what means God will use to save somebody. So those who have taken a card, that's kind of what I want you to do. It's the ministry of intercession. Let's lift our hands and praise the Lord. Let's give him thanks. We're going to read Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. We're going to use the New Living Translation. If it appears on the screen, we'll read alternately. If it doesn't, and brethren, I think it's important for you to understand that sometimes when there's a trouble with uh, what comes up on the screen, it's really not the fault of the persons who help us with the media. It's 
um, forces that are outside of their control. So don't blame them every time you see a problem, all right? Romans chapter 4, we're going to read alternately or responsively. Of course, this is Paul's letter. This is a part of Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. But people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Now, is this blessing only for the Jews, or is it also for uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. This is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, 
he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit, it was recorded. Together, he was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. I want us to just look at verse 6 again. This is very powerful. David also spake of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. I want you to turn to somebody and say to them, ask them, are you working for it or have you just accepted it? Ask somebody else. Are you working for your salvation? Or have you just accepted it that God has saved you? Greet several people before you take your seat. Several people, several people. Greet them warmly. I'm going to ask you, as Sister Celia Morgan comes to welcome us and to let us know what's on the agenda here at Pentecostal Tabernacle, I, I want you to just turn to one person and tell them what Brother Wright told me when he greeted me. He just greeted me and said, it is mine. <laughs> tell somebody it is mine. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord, everybody. And on a day when much of the world waits with bated breath for the grand finale between Argentina and Germany, we are privileged. We are privileged to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? And we are privileged to know a God who never disappoints and who never fails. And who is well able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Amen, amen. I must confess that I was among those who was greatly disappointed after a particular team was demolished on the field. I never had a good afternoon at all. But guess what? When I remember the God that I serve. And I know that my God never disappoints me. And I know that my focus and my faith is not in man and man's ability. Because they'll always let you down. 
or most of the time, you know, I rejoiced and I, my spirits were lifted, you know, that I serve a God in whom I can always trust. And every time he goes out on that field, he goes out and he wins. I have that confidence. So we rejoice this morning in the kind of God that we serve, you know, and we worship his name. And in spite of what the rest of the world will be doing, our focus will be on Almighty God for the time that we are going to be in His sanctuary. Amen? Amen. And it's this kind of worship atmosphere that I'm going to invite those who are visiting with us today to stand and be acknowledged. Praise God. You have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And it's such a pleasure to have you worshiping with us today from wherever you are and from wherever you have come praise God thank you so much for coming I just want to encourage you to keep your mind fixed on the Lord he brought you here because he has a very special blessing for you but guess what you have to open your heart to him in order to receive that blessing amen don't be afraid and don't be alarmed when you see us worshiping because we worship in different ways, in different styles. Sometimes we are very expressive. And we are expressive because we know the circumstances from which our God has delivered us. Amen? Praise God. I'd like to specially welcome Sister M. Barnaby. I believe she's visiting from Orlando, Florida. Are you here, Sister Barnaby? Uh, where is she? Okay, there she is in the middle. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. I'd just like to quickly share with you some of the activities which will be taking place here and elsewhere this week. Of course, this evening at 6.45, there is evening service in the sanctuary. And I'm sure our pastor would want for me to invite everybody to return to what promises to be a great service this evening. Praise God. To, tomorrow, National Junior Camp begins and it ends on Friday. Oh, it's teen camp tomorrow. I'm sorry, the information I have here says Junior Camp, but please note that it's teen camp that takes place tomorrow. I've also been advised that a bus will be at the campsite on Friday. There's a cost attached to the bus. I believe it's $1,000. Yes. It's $1,000 per person to travel that bus to get back to Kingston? Yes. Okay. Okay. So please bear that in mind, all the participants. On Tuesday at 6 p.m., there's ACA training. And of course, ACA is our Apostolic Counselors Association. There'll be a great training session on parenting responsibility to preserve our children's sexual purity. And that's part two of a presentation that was previously held. And this is gonna be held in the Ralph and Helen Reynolds Hall. All are invited, especially parents and those working with children and teenagers. On Wednesday, beginning at 6.30 in the morning, there'll be morning manna and everybody's invited to participate. At 11.30 a.m., there's prayer and fasting service right here. At 6.45 in the evening, there's prayer and Bible study there will also be a Sheaves of Christ, the bake sale after Bible study. On Sunday, we do it all over again, beginning with rightly dividing the word at 6 o'clock in the morning. That can be heard on RJR's Fame FM. And at 7 o'clock, there's prayer time in the sanctuary. At 8 o'clock, there's great precession followed by Sunday school. And at 10.15, there's worship service, children's church, and teen tab. And of course, we have another great uh, evening service planned for next week, Sunday. Uh, we do encourage you to continue to participate in our daily Bible reading sessions. Today, we are at Romans 16. Next Sunday, we expect to be at Judges 7. Just to make you aware of some general announcements, all persons who have been called out for the cold water challenge are being asked to submit the funds to any member of the youth committee by Sunday, July 27. And if there are any members of this committee, the youth committee here, I'm just going to ask you to stand 
so that the relevant persons will know to whom they are to pass these funds. And of course, we see at least two members standing over here. If you look around, you will see, ah, there are two. Where's the other? Oh, there's another over here. Brother Nathan, our youth president himself. We have Sister Jody, who's on the choir. All right, so any of these members, and if you have been following social media, you, will certainly have, you would certainly have seen some wonderful um, captures of certain persons who have taken this cold water challenge. I lift my cap to you all, and um, I wish you all the best. <laughs> Pentab scholarship application forms are available at the church office. Tuesdays to Thursdays between 9 o'clock in the morning and 4.30 in the afternoon. And on a Friday between 9 o'clock and 3.30 p.m. Or you can pick up a form from any member of the committee. And these committee members are sisters Paula Walters, Hermine McFarlane, Suzette Williamson, Yondin Wright, or brother Varden Downer. Applications close on July 31. The Stretch Ministry Singles Retreat is scheduled for October 23 to 25. And the venue this year is the Jewel Duns River Resort and Spa Oterias in St. Anne. Very exotic place, really, really nice. The cost, however, is US $200 per person. And that's for triple occupancy, okay? So you can share that cost. Registration fee is 1,000 Jamaican dollars. A deposit of US $40 is required by July 27. And I see we are varying between Jamaican and US dollars these days because we're not quite sure what our dollar is doing. Praise God. Help us to keep our social services going at Pentecostal Tabernacle, the Pentab Community Clinic, after school programs, Community Sunday School Program, Pentab Nursery and Daycare, Pentap Early Childhood Institute, Pentap High School, Day and Evening Programs, Skills Training, and the Pentap It's Sewing Institute. All these comprise the Stewardship Ministry and um, the Project Hope Foundation. And both sets of ministries will on Saturday, August 2, at 2.15 in the afternoon, walk through different communities. All right, so we're being invited by the Stewardship Ministry and the Project Hope Foundation to walk with them throughout the communities, surrounding communities of the church and elsewhere uh, to sort of promote the activities and the work that they do. You're being asked to pick up a registration form at the front desk of the church office and check the notice board for further information, okay? Pentap High and Evening Institute now registering students for September 2014. The evening program requires one registration fee, and any two non-lab subjects are for free. See the notice boards for further details. The fellowship ministry, in association with the Zonal Outreach Ministry, presents Family Fun Day 2014 under the theme Fellowship for Fun, and this will take place on Saturday, August 9. Okay, so that's Saturday after the Independence and Emancipation Holidays. Get ready for the needle and thread, Nyamings Relay, Catch the Bus, Family Feud, Minute to Win It. These are among competitions that are going to be held. Sounds very exciting to me. All right, so let's all prepare for that and um, get set to win. A one-bedroom with, one, with its own kitchen and bathroom is available for rent in Portmore. If you are interested, you may call 886 9020. And quickly, some upcoming events. July 20, She's for Christ, Be an Example Drive. July 21 to 25, National Youth Camp. July 23, Pray and Bible Study. July 24, Zone and Outstation Leaders Meeting. July 26, National Youth Bible Quiz Finals. And July 27, Sweets for Sheaves Bake Sale. Uh, in terms of our bereavement notices, sadly, Brother Colin Roy passed away on Thursday, July 10. The funeral for the granddaughter of Sister Myrtle Francis will be held at 2 p.m. on Sunday, July 20. 
at the Open Bible Church. This is at 54C Spanish Town Road. The funeral for Sister Hilda Pottinger will be held on Thursday, July 24, here at Pentecostal Tabernacle. The funeral for the father of Brother Samuel Bryant will be held on Saturday, July 19. And this, is, this will take place at the Smithville Church of God. And this is in Smithville, Clarendon. And the time is midday. So that's 12 midday. All right, we ask that you continue to pray for the bereaved families. And if at all you're able to support these families at the funerals, please do so. It, it really, really helps when we do that. Amen? And before I go, I had omitted to welcome our faithful viewers on live stream. Thank you so much. Week after week, you have tuned in and you have given us your comments. Um, we continue to pray for you and we pray that you will continue to support us as we say, God bless you in Jesus' name. And if you're if you are having a birthday or a special anniversary this week, we just want to wish on behalf of our pastor and Sister Bartlett and the entire membership of Pentecostal Tabernacle a wonderful day and a wonderful week in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. Amen. And for those who have um, not yet re received your certificate, in respect of the Logistics 101 seminar, you need to see Brother Sheridan Forbes or Brother Lestine Rose after the service to collect that certificate. And all the members of the 18 to 25 um, Sunday school class, that's the female Sunday school class, you're being asked to meet in the dining room after the service. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, we have some special guests uh, visiting with us from overseas. I see the service family visiting from USA, uh, from Virginia, USA. Jocelyn and Kirk Smith are here too. Emily and Gussie Frank from, from Washington. Wow. And Brother Joseph Dempster is here. Where are you, folks? Would you stand, please? Even if you stood already. Please stand again so we can. Wonderful. We're, we're, we're really delighted that you are here, that you chose to worship here. We, we don't have to um, welcome you with a warm welcome. You have already received a very warm welcome. The welcome is so warm that some of us didn't even wear our jackets today. But may the Lord bless you. Thank you so much for coming. Let's clap our hands for these special guests. All right, we're going to be receiving our offering now. We're going to ask our ushers to come. Let's all stand, everybody. We want to uh, ensure that we are faithful to the Lord. And as we have been observing, giving is really just another part of our worship. It's a great experience. We have a wonderful opportunity. Here at Pentecostal Tabernacle, we believe and practice giving a tithe or a tenth of whatever God has blessed us with, both through the means of salary and otherwise, we give a tenth of that to the Lord. And we do that because Abraham, our spiritual father, was a tither. So we have tried to be faithful in that area. And the Lord will be a debtor to no man. There is nobody who can outgive God. Let me try that again in English. There is nobody who can outgive God. Amen. Bow your heads, please. Lord, 
we are determined to be faithful to you in every area of our lives. Lord, we do not want for there to be any lack in our lives. We want every area to be strong. Help us, Lord, as we give to recognize that you love a cheerful giver. Help us to understand, Lord, that as we give and make an investment in your kingdom, we are really making an investment in our own futures because you will not forget even a cup of cold water. So bless us now as we come. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Our musicians and singers are leading us in worship as we march today and as we give as unto the Lord. Let's come with a worshipful, glad spirit, cheerfully as we give as unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every word, every word of worship is one accord. Yes, every praise, every praise is to our God. Let's sing it one more time. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship, every word of worship is one 
Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. He is worthy. Hallelujah. And he reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God reigns. Oh, let's continue to worship the Lord, everybody. Yes. Hallelujah. ministry.
before the throne is where we come to offer praise and seek wisdom you have torn the veil that separates no more outside now is where we come to offer praise. We seek wisdom. You have torn the veil that separates no more 
Would you stand, please, everyone? When we, when we sing about in your presence is where we must be, we have to be very conscious that that also means when we're outside of church we are outside of a gathering of God's people, we must be conscious that we are living in the presence of the King. So in his presence doesn't just mean in the sanctuary. Even when we are all by ourselves, we must be conscious that we are in his presence. Amen? In your presence is where I should be. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Lord Jesus, help us now, we beg of you in Jesus' name. You may be seated, please. Evidently, the Lord Jesus regularly attended the service of the synagogue. A typical synagogue service opened with an invocation for God's blessing, and then the recitation of the traditional Hebrew confession of faith, which is found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, and Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 21. This was followed by prayer and the prescribed readings from the law and from the prophets. And the reader would paraphrase the Hebrew scriptures in Aramaic. This was followed by a brief sermon given by one of the men of the congregation, or perhaps by a visiting rabbi. If a priest was present, the service closed with a benediction. Otherwise, one of the laymen prayed and the meeting was dismissed. Since Jesus was already widely known and regarded as a teacher, he may have been invited on this occasion to read the scripture text and to give the sermon. Or it may be that he himself wanted to address the congregation in Nazareth because he had a special message for them. 
and maybe he sees the opportunity to do so. The passage he read included Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2. Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2, and he selected this passage for the text of his sermon. And we have entitled this message, The Agenda of Jesus Christ. The Agenda of Jesus Christ. Now the Jewish rabbis interpreted this passage from Isaiah to refer to the Messiah. And all the people knew this. Everybody in the synagogue knew this was a messianic passage. It spoke to the Messiah who should come and deliver them. And Jesus in this passage is claiming to be this promised Messiah. He claims to be the one who is speaking in Isaiah's passage. Because in verse 21 of our text, he says, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So he's saying, you've been longing for a Messiah. Well, I am announcing myself to be such a one. You can imagine how shocked. They were when this carpenter's son said that this passage was written about him. Can you imagine? And that he was the one who had come in to usher in the acceptable year of the Lord. This phrase, the acceptable year of the Lord, is really a reference to the jubilee. Described in Leviticus 25. Now you know that every seventh year was a sabbatical year for the nation of Israel. The land was allowed to rest during the sabbatical year. Now after the seven sabbatical years, the year after was the 50th year. And that year was set apart as a year of jubilee. The main purpose of this special year was, I guess you could call it the balancing of the economic system. Slaves were set free and returned to their families. Property that was sold reverted back to the original owner. Wouldn't that be nice if that happened now? And all debts were canceled. The land lay idle or fallow. Man and beast rested and rejoiced in the Lord. The problem is, brethren, that this was a provision that God had given. But there is no evidence in scripture that even one jubilee was celebrated. And of course, this all looked ahead to the great jubilee. That should come when Messiah came. So Jesus applies all of this to his ministry. The Jubilee. Now not in a political or economic sense. But in a physical and spiritual sense. And that leads me to talk a little about the kingdom of God. Are you still there? kingdom of God is one of the great themes of the Bible. And it was a central theme in the ministry and teaching of Jesus. If you read the Gospels, almost everything that Jesus said and did had to do with the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, everything. In fact, when he came preaching, the first thing he said was repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. To talk about the kingdom of God is to talk about God's rule or his act of reigning. 
want you to stay with me now, brethren. Please, you have to concentrate. Amen? This is not shouting material. This is hard material. The kingdom of God does not refer to a place. It refers instead to God's will, God's power, and God's authority. The kingdom of God is not a group of people, and it is not life in some future heaven. The kingdom of God advances now whenever people submit themselves to the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. People come into the kingdom when they accept God's authority and begin to do his will. So the kingdom of God is not a place. Most importantly, the kingdom refers to the king, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Jesus not only proclaimed the message of the kingdom, but he was the embodiment of the reality of the kingdom. Don't forget our subject, the agenda of Jesus Christ. Jesus had authority over demons. He had authority over nature. He had authority over sickness. He had authority over death. He taught with authority. And he had the authority to forgive sins. He was the embodiment of the kingdom. The mystery of the kingdom of God, and it is a mystery, is that it is both already here and not yet here. That's the mystery of the kingdom of God. It is both present and future. We may say that the spiritual aspects of the kingdom of God are already, they are present, but the political aspect of the kingdom is not yet, and future. The best way to understand the mystery of the kingdom of God is to appreciate that in the person and ministry of Jesus, the age of to come, intruded into the present age. The to come came into the now. Jesus was in the presence of the future. And he has drawn the citizens of the kingdom into the future with him. Evil still exists. Satan still rages. He's still the God of this world. We still long for the peace and justice of God. So the kingdom of God is here, but not fully here. So the church lives at the intersection of the already and the not yet. Too many of us who call ourselves Christian have a church-centered view of the kingdom instead of a kingdom-centered view of the church. We look at the kingdom of God through the eyes of the church instead of looking at the church through the eyes of the kingdom of God. We keep putting the cart 
before the horse. The kingdom of God is not a part of the church. The church is a part of the kingdom of God. Indeed, it was the kingdom that created the church. In the sense that Jesus formed the church to fulfill his kingdom agenda for this present age. Until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So we need to cultivate a kingdom view of the church. The church is not an end in itself. That's what's causing us a lot of problems. Everything we do is locked up in the church. The church is a means to an end. The church is a means to extending the rule and reign of the kingdom of God throughout the world now. But there will come a day when there will be no more church. There will never come a day when there is no more kingdom of God. In the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation, we find a genuine interaction between Jesus Christ and his church. serious. In these two chapters, he addresses seven first century churches and says some very interesting things to each of them. Have you ever read the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor? When we read these letters, we see that Jesus has an opinion on the way churches are constituted and how his people operate. He has an opinion. And his opinion is not always positive. In, in Revelation chapter 3, you know, he told the church at Laodicea, he said, look, I don't even have anything that I can commend you for. He said, as a matter of fact, you make me sick. He said, really what I want to do when I think about you is vomit. Here's the thing we do, folks. Here's the thing we do. We say we have come up with this idea that the seven churches represent seven different stages of the church's development. So we say this is, you know, the church of the end time, the backslidden church. That's what we say. Now, I'm not even trying to contradict that. It may be so. What I'm trying to say is that Jesus wrote this letter or these letters to seven churches that existed, were existing at the time. And the problems he described were in the churches at the time. These were first century churches. There was no Trinitarian controversy. None of these churches had a problem with how baptism was to be administered. All of these churches accepted the initial sign of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Gifts of the Spirit were, was operating in all these churches when Paul wrote to them. First century churches. Every one of them. But... The Lord had a problem with some of them. In fact, in chapter 3 and verse 20, he told the Laodicean church, 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So we say that wherever two or three are gathered together, the Lord is there in the midst. And we add to bless. You won't find that in the text, but we always say that in the midst to bless. I suppose you would bless if he's in the midst, eh? But does that give us, does that passage give us the assurance that we think that just because we come together and say we do it in the name of Jesus that God is there? So then how is he on the outside while they are inside? How is it that Jesus is, isn't in the midst to bless? He says, I stand at the door and knock. What is he doing on the outside of his own church? First century church. Tongue speaking church. Clap on church. These letters reveal that Jesus is aware of what is happening in the assemblies. Every one of the letters start with, I know thy works. In every case, he has a strong opinion about what is going on. And the fact that Jesus has a strong opinion about what is going on in every assembly should cause us to have at least a holy fear as it relates to how we go about doing church. At the very least, it should cause us to ask these questions. How much of what passes for church in our meetings would Jesus find acceptable? How much of what we do in a service is consciously and deliberately done to glorify God? Not every worship experience that God's people participates in is acceptable to God. I wanted to listen to these two assessments that God has. Of the word had of the worship experience of his people in the Old Testament. And both of these assessments reflect the message rendering. First one is Isaiah chapter 1, 11 to 17. This is what God has to say. Why this frenzy of sacrifices? God's asking. Don't you think I've had my fill of burnt sacrifices? Rams and plump grain-fed calves? Don't you think I've had my fill of blood from bulls, lambs, and goats? When you come before me, whoever gave you the idea of acting like this? Running here and there, doing this and that. All this sheer commotion in the place provided for worship. Quit your worship charades. I can't stand your trivial religious games. Monthly conferences, weekly Sabbaths, special meetings, 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 meetings. I can't stand one more meeting for this, meeting for that. I hate them. You have worn me out. I'm sick of your religion, religion, you religion, while you go right on sinning. When you put on your next prayer performance, I'll be looking the other way, no matter how long or loud or often you pray. I'll not be listening. And do you know why? Because you've been tearing people in pieces. And your hands are bloody. Go home and wash up. Clean up your act. Sweep your lives clean of your evil doing so I don't have to look at them any longer. Say no to wrong. Learn to do good. Work for justice. Help the down and out. Stand up for the homeless. 
God is interested in more than fornication and adultery. Go to bat for the defenseless. Amos 5, 21 to 24. I can't stand your religious meeting. I'm fed up with your conferences and conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects. Your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations, and your image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice. Oceans of it. I want fairness. Rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. Now, brethren, in both these scenarios, there was no lack of religious activity. They had a religious activity. There was no scarcity of external demonstration. There was no lack of the observance of tradition. No shortage of a form of godliness. But there was no power, no reality, no genuine manifestation of God. Everything had to be worked up because nothing was being sent down. If nothing is being sent down, you have to work something up. That's why we have so much gimmicks. That's why the apostolic church has so many gimmicks. All that some churches offer is a wonderful, aesthetically pleasing, professional, spiritual performance. But the sovereign move of God is absent. In reality, what we have are human beings doing their best to be substitutes for the Holy Ghost. Working in the lives of his people. I don't want to be in a church like that. Count me out. I believe the postmodern church. In many areas of the western world. Is in serious trouble. I believe the church is in danger of becoming irrelevant. Not only to the world around us. But even to the Christians. A man named William Esom wrote a book called Sacred Cows Make Gourmet Burgers. You know what a sacred cow is? Sacred cow is a person or a program or a system that you can't do away with even when it's not working. Because it was so and so that started it. So we just have to go on with it. But this man says sacred cows make gourmet burgers. I want you to listen to what he said. We live in a time unlike any other time that any living person has known. It is not merely that things are changing. Change itself has changed, thereby changing the rules by which we live. Quantum leaps are happening that are nothing like evolution. So what the man is saying is not gradual change anymore. It's not things not evolving. They remove us totally from our previous context. Simply learning. To do old chores faster. Or to be able to adapt old forms. To more complex situations. No longer produces the desired results. Running faster and harder in ministry. Will not work in this new world. 
established churches are becoming increasingly ineffective because our past has not prepared us for ministry in the future. Very little in our past has prepared us for ministry in today's world. Many of us in the church have ceased to operate as salt and light. And therefore we have ceased to give life and hope and healing. Because we're not linked in with Jesus' agenda. We have our church agenda. We are operating to preserve the status quo. The glory of God is not really on our agenda. This, I'm not saying that we don't have any hope. I'm saying the hope that we have is no longer based necessarily on existing structures and methods, many of which are outdated and in some cases harmful. I am saying that we desperately need new ways of thinking about church and operating as the church. And perhaps what we need are old ways, old first century apostolic ways. Of operating as the church. The truth is, to a great extent, the church no longer represents or manifests an alternative counterculture. Rather, the church just reflects the beliefs and attitudes and practices of the world. We want the church to be run like Grace Kennedy. See the church at Laodicea? Church of, the word Laodicea means people rule. Did you know that? People rule. That's what Laodicea means. Every decision, it was, it's called the democratic church. Every rule in the church had to be voted on. Nobody could hear from God. It had to, had, everything had to go before a committee. What is clear, brothers and sisters, to me at least, is that churches that continue to do things the way they have always done them will suffer from the law of diminishing returns. We who are in the present apostolic church must prayerfully yet boldly seek after new 21st century wineskins that can hold the first century wine. We need to do that in order to become relevant so that we can engage and incarnate with the desperate, broken, sinful people of our world. We need to find a way to get into their lives. Need some wineskins. We have the wine, but we need some wineskins that will not keep them away, but will help us to go to them. As wine is no good if nobody not drinking. Truth is, brethren, this present apostolic church. Desperately need to see a consistent and intense manifestation of the glory of God. That's the only way we will be credible to the people of the world. And even to our young people coming up. Maybe we will experience the glory of God when we as individuals... And as a corporate body, decide to set aside our private personal agendas and adopt his agenda. What is his agenda? He unveils it in Luke 4, 18 to 19. 
said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why is the spirit of the Lord upon me? Because he has anointed me. Why has he anointed you? To preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the broken hearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering of sight to the blind. Set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's my agenda, Jesus said. And it better be the church's agenda. It was the disciples' agenda. You read the early part of the book of Acts. They preached the kingdom of God too. Something we need to note. In Isaiah, we, we said that Jesus quoted Isaiah 61, 1 to 2. And he applied it to himself. But, but there's something we need to, to, to see. Jesus stopped midstream. In the prophecy of Isaiah, if you go to Isaiah 61, 1 to 2, what you will find that immediately following the words to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord are the very sobering words and the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus did not quote that part of the scripture. He left it out. Bible said he stopped at the acceptable year of the Lord and he sat down and gave the man back the book. What he was saying to us is I'm putting judgment on hold. I am the Messiah ushering in the kingdom of God which has been promised for so long. What I am emphasizing is not judgment, but deliverance. I'm not emphasizing the condemnatory aspect of my ministry now. I've come to save. I've come to stress mercy, not judgment. What was his agenda? Six things. Six things on his, on his agenda. To preach the gospel to the poor. Word poor refers to one who hides himself out of fear. One who crouches or cowers. Speaks of one who is poverty stricken. Powerless to help himself or herself. Powerless to do anything to change their condition. It refers to those who are conscious of their spiritual depravity. Those who are aware that they are lost and undone without God. And they will therefore embrace the gift of God's grace that is preached in the gospel. I've come to preach the gospel to people who would normally think of themselves good enough to come in the synagogue. My ministry is going to be a sidewalk ministry. An inner city ministry. A ghetto ministry. Preach the gospel to the poor. Is that on your agenda? Is it on my agenda? To heal the broken hearted. Word broken hearted is the translation of a Greek word. Which means to shatter. To break in pieces by crushing. Speaks to the crushed condition of a broken hearted person refers to those who have been crushed completely. Those who have been broken into pieces and have no hope. Jesus said, I have come to heal the broken hearted. I have come to make them whole. Not just physical. 
spiritually. I've come to deal with them spiritually and emotionally. You don't have to hurt no more. You don't have to cry no more. Where is the healing? I've come to heal broken hearted. What is on your agenda? To preach deliverance to the captives. The word deliverance means freedom and pardon. It refers to a release from bondage and imprisonment. It speaks to liberation from captivity. But the word also means remission of sins. In many places in the New Testament, it is translated as forgiveness. I've come to preach liberation to the crackhead. I've come to tell the gambler you can be free. I've come to tell the drug addict that when I'm through with you, you will be completely cured. I've come to tell the lesbian and the homosexual, when I'm through with you, I'll straighten out your thinking. I've come to preach deliverance. You do not have to be like that anymore I've come to tell the prostitute there is value in you you don't have to sell yourself anymore I think more of you than that is that on your agenda when you think of church or do you think of coming and having a good time and serving in a ministry and holding a position. Sometimes I think one night I'll just walk the streets with some money and just go to one of the ladies. And say, how much you charge to spend a whole night with a man? I want to engage you. I will pay you to spend the night with me. And this other man here. See, you have to make sure you have a witness. And just talk to her the whole, she's not going to lose any money. Just talk to our whole night about the love of God. Is that on your agenda? Or is it your agenda to turn up your nose? And say, so when are you going to stop living those nasty life? Like you who used to be so clean before God saved you. You think you're fooling God? Even now God knows what's in your mind. Deliverance to the captives, man. Deliverance to the captives. You church don't have to take no from the devil. Everybody can be saved. I believe that with all my heart. And if you don't believe it, don't preach the gospel. You are a disgrace to the ministry. Preaching of deliverance to the captives must be on the church's agenda. To preach recovering of sight to the blind. The word blind there can mean either physical or spiritual blindness. 
You know, it is used to speak of the dullness of spiritual perception due to the hardening of the heart. It was on the agenda of Jesus to restore sight to those who are physically blind and to open the understanding of those whose spiritual perception is dull because they have hardened their hearts. Jesus is coming to say, I want to deal with you. I want to give you back your perception so that you can see me right and see the word right. And I hope the church will continue with my agenda. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Word bruised again means to crush. Speaks of those who are downtrodden and defeated and destroyed. The Lord said, I'm not leaving out even those that society write off. I come for you. Come for Mary Magdalene. If I have to cast out seven devils, I'll cast them out and not leaving you behind. You're not too much of a challenge for me. We better get rid of you know, our little biases and our little concepts that we have. Can I advise you that Jesus had a powerful spitting ministry? All of you that have delicate sensibilities. Wonder, there's a famous one where he spat in the ground and made some mud cakes and put on the man's eye. We are all familiar with that one. But I read in Mark that there was a man that was blind and Jesus spat in his eyes. Yes, you don't like that. But Jesus had a spitted ministry. Sorry for you. Deal with it. Deal with it. Or tear out the page of the book then. Wonder what you would have done if you were there. Oh my God. Everything must be conventional for you. Everything must be comfortable. Everything must be in the box. I'm not telling you to go and spit in anybody's eye. I'm telling you to do what God says do. Even if people don't think you should. We just read these things and pass over them. And don't consider today what would happen. Maybe you had in the early church spitting songs and choruses. If our agenda, I'm closing, if our agenda is different from the agenda of Jesus, Either as individuals or as the body of Christ, we are not functioning as the church. These six things must be on our agenda. We are not here to perform. We are not here to preserve status quo. We are not here to preserve ourselves and what we do in the name of Pentecostal Tabernacle. Jesus said to the church, in Sardis, you have a name only. You're dead. All you have is a name. Critical to our, our understanding of the kingdom. The same ministry, kingdom ministry that Jesus was involved in. He involved the 12 disciples in it. Matthew chapter 10 says, when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them heal the sick 
cleansed the lepers, raised the dead. It wasn't only Jesus that raised the dead. Sorry to disturb your theology. He gave them power to raise the dead. Cast out devils. That should be on the agenda of the church. Jesus said to the twelve, not me alone, you do it too. I'm giving you power to do it too. But that's not the only thing, folks. Luke chapter 10 verses 1 to 9 records the giving of a similar commission to 72 other disciples. These 72, the 12 were not included in this. The same thing Jesus said to them. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. This, is, this has implications for us because it tells us that this kingdom ministry is not just for the apostles. When last have you, when last have you operated in the realm of kingdom ministry? Oh yeah, we've been doing church for sure. We've been doing, we do it, we involved in a lot of programs. When last have we, do, have we done kingdom ministry? John 20 verse 21, the Lord said, Peace be unto you. As my Father had sent me, even so send I you. And immediately after that, the Bible says, He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And this reminds us that after God had made a man, he breathed into the man's nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. So Jesus used new creation language to convey his point. What is his point? I am remaking you disciples in order to continue my kingdom mission in the earth. My kingdom mission of remaking all creation. So what is on the agenda of those of us who are at Pentecostal Tabernacle? Is it kingdom ministry or is it doing church? Satisfying the, you know, like the annual report and business. Is that what we are about? Appointing people to position. Is that what we are about? Making sure that all the forms are dotted. Making sure we complete all the application forms. Are we becoming irrelevant? I'm asking. Are we operating as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are we operating merely to perpetuate tradition? Do people only know us for what we are against? Do they really know what we are for? Are we for anything or are we just against everything? The man in the street, do they know what the church is for? Or do they only know what the church is against? Do they know that we are for love? And for redemption? And for restoration? And for healing? And for deliverance? Are we a church in name only? Is the spirit of the Lord upon us? Has he anointed us? What has he anointed us to do? Is it merely to speak in tongues and to dance in the spirit and run the aisle? Are we more concerned about making disciples of ourselves and of our churches than we are about making disciples of Jesus Christ? I want to end now with a quote. Ask, let's stand. I want to read a quote to you. I, I'm really thinking a lot about the church, you know, brethren. Thinking a lot about the church. So why I'm thinking about the church is because the Lord has not yet come. And so the church has to go into the future. And I'm saying the church can't go into the future like this. 
Listen to this. Listen to this, brethren. Go and send you away after this. The church gets in trouble whenever it thinks it is in the church business rather than the kingdom business. In the church business, people are concerned with church activities, religious behavior, and spiritual things. In kingdom business, people are concerned with kingdom activities, all human behavior, and everything God has made, visible and invisible. Kingdom people see human affairs as saturated with spiritual meaning and kingdom significance. Kingdom people seek first the kingdom of God and its justice. Church people often put church work above the concerns of justice, mercy, and truth. Church people think about how to get people into the church. Kingdom people think about how to get the church into the world. Church people worry that the world might change the church. Kingdom people work to see the church change the world. If the church has one great need, it is this. To be set free for the kingdom of God. To be liberated from itself as it has become. In order to be itself as God intends. If we're not careful, we're going to end up like Laodicea. First century church. Possibly very orthodox in terms of doctrine. No controversy in terms of the oneness of God. Speaking in tongues. But lacking a vital faith. Because the agenda of God is not our agenda. We have our own church agenda. Satisfying other things than the kingdom of God. Let's lift our hands and worship God. We're in the church because the church is God's means of furthering the kingdom in this age. Make sure that we're doing kingdom work. I want... You brethren to help me to pray that the kingdom will come to us. That we will operate as the disciples did. You know, there's nothing that Jesus did that they did not do. And his promise to them was greater works. So, I'm asking this question. You theologians up here can answer. The greater works, did it stop with the apostles? Or does it continue in the church today? So where are they? See, see brethren, I, I have to be grappling with these things, you know. Because I, I want to be... I think there's a song that says, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. I don't want to end up on the wrong side of an end time revival. I don't want to, I don't want to suffer the greatest of all tragedies. Coming home empty handed from a ripe harvest field. want when the church goes out there, we go out there to change. Stand up in the face of devils and say, get out. So that people know that the people
people of God have been here. Anybody dreaming with me? Yeah. Anybody on the choir think it's a reality? Think it's something that we need to, to pray about? Let's lift our hands and worship the Lord one more time. Lord Jesus, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for transferring us through the working of your mighty power from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We thank you for involving us in the work of the kingdom. When you taught your disciples how to pray, you said to them that they should say, Thy kingdom come. You didn't mention anything about the church. Thy kingdom come. Lord Jesus, help us at Pentecostal Tabernacle to forget about our agendas. Help us to go home and study what you had on your agenda and to pray that your agenda will become our agenda. The preaching of the gospel to the poor. The healing of the broken hearted. The deliverance of the captives. The recovering of sight to the blind. The healing of those that are bruised. And the preaching of the acceptable year of the Lord. Some of, some of us are so quick to mention the day of vengeance. You didn't mention it. You could have. You had the authority to. But not in this season. There will come a time when that vengeance will come upon mankind. But not now. Today is still the day of grace. Help us to be involved in the work of the kingdom, Lord. Help us to see the church not as an end in itself, so that our positions and our so-called ministries will not loom so large, but we will realize that these are just means to help us to do the work of the kingdom effectively. Humble our hearts today, Lord, in a very special way. Help us to walk the lowly way. Help your word to find a place of lodging in our hearts. As we go, we ask you, Lord, to minister to us in a special way. Many times we leave your house and the devil finds a way to get us to talk away the conviction and to laugh away the conviction and to eat away the conviction. And the word doesn't fall on good ground. There are persons right now, Lord. The devil has given his demons a commission. Go and steal that word out of their hearts. So that before they reach home, they would have forgotten the conviction that they are feeling now. But help us, Lord, to open our hearts to the reception of your word. To allow it to sink deep into us. 
transform us as individuals and as a church. Help us to align ourselves with your agenda. The work of the kingdom. Help us, Lord, as we explore these truths to have an open heart. We commit ourselves into your hands today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Lord, bless your brethren. Please greet each.